Look, I know if you only watch me in these YouTube videos where I talk about politics and science and women's rights and religion, you might not realize this, but I am a messy bitch. Uh, because honestly, if you spend your entire day reading and evaluating scientific papers, sometimes you want to unwind by staring at a bloody car wreck. And I got to tell you, science Twitter has been delivering lately. It's been on fire. Metaphorically, uh, I won't bore you with the very serious worm discourse that happened a few weeks ago in which the editor of a journal said that worms are overrated because all they really do is fuck themselves and someone else thought that that was an insult to minorities. We don't have time for that because while we were all still processing that, something much more bonkers happened. I followed a neuroscientist on Twitter named Beth Ann McLaughlin. Um, I've never met her. I'm not even sure why I started following her in the first place, but I suspect it had something to do with the fact that she started hashtag Me Too STEM and the Me Too STEM nonprofit organization focused on helping women in the sciences who have been sexually harassed in school or on the job. She also was the person who convinced Rate My Professor to stop rating professors based on how hot they are. Uh, plus, she convinced AAAS to start stripping honors from people who had been credibly accused of sexual harassment. Pretty good stuff. Last week, I noticed that McLaughlin tweeted a friend of hers had died from COVID-19. The friend was on Twitter as at sciencing underscore by, and I didn't follow her. So I clicked through to learn more about her. Uh, McLaughlin said that sciencing by was a queer indigenous Hopi archeologist or maybe anthropologist at Arizona State University who was forced to keep uh, teaching classes during the pandemic, which led to her catching COVID-19 and eventually succumbing to the disease. That sounded absolutely horrible. And I expressed my condolences to McLaughlin and retweeted her touching tribute to her friend. And then I wandered away to stare at my house plants for a while, because that's what I do. And a few days later, I got a DM from a friend of mine letting me know, quote, there's a greater than 0% chance that McLaughlin is just plain making up sciencing by. Now, I've been on the internet for a very long time, uh, and I've seen some shenanigans. And yet still, I had one of those reactions where I had to reread the message she sent me several times and then spend a few moments connecting this new information with my previously held understanding that McLaughlin was a normal functioning adult. Because both of these things cannot be true. You cannot be a normal functioning adult and also make up a person who died of COVID-19, right? So I poked around and I found a story that I had managed to completely miss about McLaughlin. Uh, back in May of 2019, the only people of color in the Me Too STEM organization that she started quit because they said that the group's leader, McLaughlin, was combative and unwilling to listen, uh, particularly unwilling to listen to anybody but white people. <laughs> And then in February of this year, even more people quit uh, because they say they re repeatedly pointed out uh, that McLaughlin was racist and bullying, basically, but the board refused to remove her from her position. It was all becoming a little easier to figure out uh, that I was just terribly wrong about my initial assumption that McLaughlin was a normal functioning adult. So I went back and read up on it, and it turns out, yeah, she definitely made up a queer indigenous female scientist that was her super cool best friend, but you've never met her because she goes to a different school. And then she gave her the Rona and she killed her. I basically know nothing about McLaughlin other than everything I've just told you, but her motivations seem pretty clear. Like... 
I can't be racist because my best friend is indigenous. And then, you know, you can only keep an imaginary friend around so long, so you may as well kill her off in a way that will get you a lot of attention from your peers, reinforce a point that many of us have been pushing recently, that keeping schools open during a pandemic is dangerous, and, you know, you get out of it with maximum sympathy points, because you were her best friend. This is obviously extremely upsetting for a lot of people for a number of reasons. Um, in one fell swoop, McLaughlin made a mockery of academics concerned about COVID-19, women of color uh, fighting discrimination in STEM fields, and marginalized people who need to remain anonymous on social media. For a lot of people, um, I think this might have been their first time getting catfished. People are always trying to be someone they're not on the internet, but it's rare that this happens quite so publicly and with so much potential to fuck a bunch of people up. Um, after all, this has now actually hit the New York Times, which is nuts. Not even the worm fight got into the New York Times. So yeah, a lot of people are feeling hurt and betrayed. And while this situation is completely bonkers, I've actually been through something like it before. Many, many years ago, we had a skeptic meetup in New York City. I was there along with a bunch of my writers and we met at a bar in Manhattan and invited commenters who were in the area to come join us. And a number of them did. One of the people who showed up was a frequent commenter uh, who used the name Ristofen. He offhandedly told some of the writers that he happened to be dying, uh, but he wouldn't go into any detail about what it was that he was dying of, just that he didn't have much time left. Um, whatever he was dying of, it didn't seem to affect him getting super drunk and partying with us until the bars closed, but you know, maybe there's ways to die that still allow you to tie one on every night. Um, so, you know, we believed him because why wouldn't we? Who would lie about that? Uh, over the next few months, he would email us about his condition or comment on Skeptic about it, but he still would never tell anyone exactly what his condition was. Eventually, uh, his comments and emails were replaced by those of a woman named Sabrina, who claimed to be his friend. She let us know that he was now in the hospital, unable to get on the internet, uh, and that the end was near. Uh, but she said that he absolutely forbade her from telling anyone his real name or what hospital he was at or what he was dying of. Now, it's worth noting that our website is called Skeptic, <laughs> and it's literally about critical thinking and not believing everything you're told without evidence. So by the time Sabrina stepped in, we were all beyond skeptical. Um, and I went back and I reread a bunch of the emails that we were exchanging, and it's both funny and heartbreaking. Um, so sure enough, this Sabrina was emailing us and commenting on Skeptic from the exact same IP address as Ristofen, and she wrote with the exact same grammar and style. And we were all sharing this information with each other, like, would someone really make this up? Like, what do we do about this? Um, Sabrina claimed to be really upset and she said she needed our help, but repeatedly refused to give us any information to verify that she was telling the truth. So when she told us that Ristofen had died, we just didn't do anything because <laughs> she still refused to give us any evidence. And I think she wanted us to post some sort of memorial or something on Skeptic. And we talked about that and we were just like, we don't believe this. <laughs> this just didn't happen. We, by that point, we were just convinced that he was a fake. Um, so sure enough, after we blanked him for a few weeks, he came clean and he announced that he was alive and that this was all just a very clever art project because he's an artist or something. It was extremely embarrassing for him. So we all just sort of blocked him and moved on. But I'm going through these emails and I see that a few months later, one of my writers said that 
she had a commenter on one of her posts who was talking about killing himself. And she said, I have to admit, I'm awfully jaded about this after Ristofen. She had no idea how to handle it anymore. Like normally she'd be upset and concerned and try to help him. But now it's like, is this person just playing me? And that's exactly the problem with this type of shit. It robs you of your empathy. The next time someone sees a person of color tweeting anonymously, about the sciences, they're now more likely to think, is this person for real? And on the one hand, that's good because we do have an epidemic of white people using people of color as these personas to try on to elevate their cause. Gamergate did it, 4chan does it all the time, blacks for Trump do it. So it's good to be skeptical, but as with most topics, it's not good to be so skeptical that you become antagonistic to people that remind you of that one time you got catfished. There really are indigenous scientists working today and you can follow them on Twitter and you can learn from them like Kim Tallbear, Debbie Reese, Catherine Crocker, Jacqueline Keeler, uh, Lydia Jennings, who is actually at University of Arizona. Uh, full disclosure, I wasn't following all of the women I just named, but I am now. You can find links to their stuff in the transcript. Um, but don't worry, uh, I started following them, but I removed three random white people to replace them because I'm racist against the whites. I think that's actually the biggest takeaway here. Um, we can all give less of our time and attention to people like Beth Ann McLaughlin. Uh, who says, by the way, that she's off to a therapist. Thank God. I noticed some people are annoyed because uh, they felt that by mentioning that she was checking herself into therapy, she, she's sort of blaming mental health. And uh, just because you have a mental illness, it doesn't mean you do horribly destructive things to marginalized people. But speaking as a medicated, mentally ill person, that bitch needs therapy. So yeah, good for her. Um, but regardless, we can spend less of our precious energy on bonkers white ladies and worm Twitter, uh, so that we can spend more of our energy on positive things like black in neuro week. Uh, that's a, a whole week of black scientists standing up to talk about their lives and their research that just wrapped up on Twitter. There's also, um, there was a week of black birders and black astronomers. Uh, these kind of hashtags make it super easy for you to find new smart people to follow. And if you're at all concerned, if you're all at all nervous that one of them is secretly a white lady trying to make up a best friend, loads of them are tweeting under their real names with real photos and real links back to their labs. So I guess what I'm saying is please don't let the catfish get you down and please continue to focus on real marginalized people who are doing really interesting work that we should all be supporting.